for all the men out in the audience tonight. We need to let the ladies know that there are some men out here. So on the count of three, what I need you to do, fellas, is I need you to make your most manly voice that you can. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Yeah. Real cute, guys, real cute. About four of us out there, very good, very good. All right, ladies, what I need you to do is I need you to point to the men out in the audience. Okay? On a count of three, what I want you is point to the men in the audience, or point to people who you feel are men. One, <laughs> one two, three. Wow, it's all, okay. A couple guys, you have no fingers pointed at you. Some of the wives not even pointing to their husbands. <laughs> now, my speech is entitled, What Maketh a Man? Guys, when did you become a man? When you were 18? When you were 21? When you got laid? When you had your first beer? When you became a father? When you were a husband? When did you know you were a man? Now, before we get to men, we're going to talk about boys a little bit, right? And as you know, if some of you don't know, Hawaii's high school graduation for boys, more than three out of 10 boys do not graduate from Hawaii's public high schools. And if you look at the chart over here, compared to the national average female, look how Hawaii's boys are performing in terms of graduation rates. And in terms of who gets bachelor degrees in this particular demographic, who's getting? Boys are behind. And there's a proliferation of girls attending more in graduate schools and undergraduate schools, and of course there are certain fields that are predominantly men, but guys, we gotta get going. Girls are passing us. Guys are behind. Boys, when they start at elementary level, we're only four points behind. In middle school, we're 10 points behind. In high school, we're 14 points behind. So what that's basically saying is that the longer boys are in public schools, the farther they fall behind. Now, I like this graph. <laughs> I think it's pretty accurate. <laughs> and guys, you know it's pretty accurate. But what it explains a lot of the differences about you know, why girls are performing better in reading and writing than boys is the brain differences. And that you know, girls' brain is more mature in reading and writing. And the tasks that teachers ask them to do, such as reading and writing, the part of the female brain is more developed more mature. Therefore, they're able to do those tasks better than guys. What about masculinity, though? What about manhood? Right? Masculinity is a constant test. Always up for grabs, always need to be proven. Guys, you know we do some stuff that we try to prove to other guys that we are men. This is basically saying boys need boys' validation to be men. Right? And Michael Kimmel, who is probably the most prominent researcher about masculinity, this is his theory, and this I see in my classroom every day. And if I'm sure adult males, I'm sure you follow this too. Where do these masculinities form? In school. Where in school? The classroom. The weight room. The locker room. And in American society, we don't really have a definite marker of when a boy becomes a man. In certain cultures, you kill a buffalo, that is a rite of passage, you are a man. In American society, we don't really have a definitive marker. And so what that does is that a lot of boys try to have to figure it out, trial and error. And some of us are like, you know what, I figured it out. Well, what about the boys who do? What about those guys? So we leave them to chance, and we hope that boys figure it out what it means to be the man. What influence a boy's perception about what it means to be a man? The media, sports, risky behavior, our peers. Probably the number one influence that influence boys, teenage boys, ideas of what it means to be a man is their peers. 
And sometimes their peers have no idea of what it means to be a man, but they think they know what it means to be a man, and then they tell their friends of what it means to be a man. So you have a bunch of boys who think they know what it means to be a man who really have no idea. Now, we have this unspoken code as fellas, as guys. And girls, you may have heard about it. It's called the guy code. And it's about these attitudes and values and beliefs that we have as men, an understanding, right? And basically, the bottom line is you're not going to be a sissy, you're not going to be a nerd, you're not going to be a wimp, you're not going to be a wuss. Other parts of this code is you're not a rat. You don't snitch out on your boys. No matter, they could be committing a crime, but you don't say a word. They could be cheating on you girls. They're not going to tell you. They're not going to say anything. <laughs> Bros before hoes. Sorry, ladies, you're second, and if they play video games, you're third. <laughs> It is, we make fun of our friends if they pick our girlfriend over us. We do a lot of cruel things. We put a lot of pressure on them to be mad. A man would pick their boys over their girls in high school, right? And what happens with these, a lot of these images is that boys, we can't live up to them. Just as a lot of girls can't live with those images of beauty, guys can't live up to those images as well. They're labeled as sissy if they cannot, or feminine. Their sexuality is questioned. Now, homophobia in the term of this is not a fear to be around homosexuals. It is the fear that other men perceive you as not, mass, not manly, a feminine. It is the fear that you'll be exposed is that you're not a real man. How many of you guys have said these phrases? Man up. Take it like a man. That's so gay. What are the assumptions we are telling boys about being a man when we use these phrases? Are those the only things that we tell men? What assumptions are embedded into those phrases? You know, I would like to hear, like, you know, be a woman. Throw them off a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> now, boys, where do they try to perform and show their masculinity? In sports, right? And boys who participate in certain sports have a higher status in school. Now, a lot of you guys are saying, you know what? School shouldn't be teaching about manhood. It's the parent's primary responsibility. It's the parent's role. Totally agree. Totally. But that goes with the underlying assumption that every student in your classroom has two loving parents that show them how. What, how is a boy supposed to learn what it means to be a man without a relationship or without their father? What are the consequences for a girl not having a relationship with their father? Say their father is absent. How is that girl supposed to know or learn? Now, these, this idea of false masculinity is not my idea, but I totally embrace it. It's by this book called Season of Life. And what it talks about is false masculinity. That in order to be a man, you have to have some kind of athletic ability. You have to bounce a ball, score a touchdown, or do something athletic. To be a man, you got to get the ladies. You got to get the chicks. And somehow, the more of a man I am, the more girls I get, that makes me a man. Right? Guys, we say that too. Oh, you, get the, you score with the girl. Oh, you're the man. And then funny, ironically enough, a lot of girls also believe that a guy who gets a lot of girls is a man too. Many of adults believe this as well. And economic success. The more of a man you are is how much money you make. And I understand you need to make a living, but I also see some rich jerks out there. <laughs> Do teenage girls have a def definition of what it means to be a man? What influences their perceptions or certain masculinities? Prince Charming, this Disney idea. Sometimes I tell the girls, sometimes a toad is a toad. <laughs> Genius. The band member. The athlete, are there any possible consequences for you girls for not having, having one? I see a lot of girls in my class who are pregnant, and the guy leaves. I see a lot of girls who are beaten up. And what happens is that they think that's what men do. Because if every woman in my family, if all the men beat them, that must be, that's what men do. 
Now here are some teenage girls that do a gender union about what girls think, guys think. It's very hilarious. But here are some girls' perceptions of masculinity or see, what it means to be a man. The only thing I don't understand is this term called swag. Now, a lot, they, they always say, you know, they call me Coach V, like, you have no swag. I, I, I don't even know what that is, <laughs> right? Apparently, swag is some kind of style. So go talk to your students or your kids and ask them what swag is. But, and here are some muscles that I think a lot of girls would appreciate. Abdominals. The back. Arms. A sexy smile. But you're forgetting the most important sexy muscle there is. Yeah. It's got to be the brain. They think they have this thing called the hypothalamus and the cerebellum, the abdulla oblongata, if I said that correctly. <laughs> right? Well, maybe you didn't check it out. Maybe this, maybe that's more sexy. Where do boys see men reading? If I'm a guy and I don't see my dad read, I don't see my coaches read, I don't see my teachers read, why should I read? Do we show boys that reading is masculine? Do we tell boys, real men read? Do we say that? Does your school do a good, good uh, promote a culture for boys where men read? Girls, is reading sexy? Is reading sexy? Do you let boys, can you let boys know that? Because I've never heard a girl say, oh, four books of Shakespeare, that's hot. <laughs> oh, four point GPA, whoo. <laughs> Many boys don't want to be perceived as smart. They'd rather be funny, crack jokes. Demonstrating intelligence can be labeled as being a sissy. We don't want to be that. And if you say reading Shakespeare is gay, I'm not going to read it. Especially my boys tell me that. Why would boys want to academically succeed if they view academic success as feminine? In other words, it's okay for girls to be smart, not boys. Now my final project in my philosophy class, what I do is I, if you ever want to stump kids, what you really say is, what is a man? And you'll get blank looks. You get a lot of blank looks. And what I do is I have my students read this book called Season of Life. It talks about what it means to be a man. We have Socratic discussions. I bring in my dad to talk about fatherhood. And some of the discussions that come out are like ideas of womanhood, what it means to be a father. And I bring different cultures. I bring in men from different ages, single, uh, married, divorced. And we talk about what it means to be a man. And we'll surprise when you have these discussions, you'll be surprised of how many students don't know their father. And there's actually a bond over there, an accidental bond that happens between students like, all right. I didn't know my father, too. I have them write a future letter to themselves. I think we ask students the wrong question. We ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up, instead of who do you want to be when you grow up? I have them conduct interviews with people who they believe are men and women of character. I have them make a pre uh, presentation of the person who they want to be. Where has character education gone? We have, spoke, we have spent so much time on reading, writing. Oh, I believe those skills are important. You need those essential skills to be successful in the 21st century. But what about character? If, we, if all our kids test well, and we're the number one country in reading and writing, and we have a nation of jerks, punks, have we succeeded? Instead, we focus on teacher evaluations, test scores. How about teaching ideas of justice? Empathy. I'm worried about our boys ending up in prison. I'm worried that girls think that this is okay and this is what men do. We all have an investment in building successful men. Your mothers, your dads, your teachers, you're going to have sons. Or some of these sons are going to be in your classroom. I would love that girls, guys, wouldn't it be awesome if there were just a bunch of great guys out there? More of them? The idea of uncommon. What does the common history teacher do? Most of you will say, lecture, boring, reading, answer the questions at the end of the book. What would the uncommon history teacher do? The uncommon history teacher would do be exciting, 
hands-on activities, debates, simulations. So would you rather be in the common history classroom or would you rather be in the uncommon history classroom? And then imagine if that uncommon just became the common. And that's why we're here at TEDx. We are here at TEDx to find uncommon ways to redesign, re-inspire our educational system. And that's what we're here to all tonight. John Wooden. With our Uncommon Lessons, we could produce men like John Wooden. If you don't know who John Wooden was, he's a successful UCLA basketball coach, many NCAA championships. But he still says, when asked, someone asked him, his assistant coach says, Coach, how do we know we're successful? About our boys, how do we know we're successful? He says, ask me in 20 years. And hopefully we can change and impact them lives just a little bit. And that's what really when I will know I am successful. We have Gandhi. We have Martin Luther King who said the purpose of education is to foster intelligence and character. Abraham Lincoln. And on a final note, this is one of my favorite quotes. If we don't teach boys the right stuff, they learn to live with the right bluff. And I hope all of us help our boys learn the right stuff so they will know what maketh a man. Thank you.